You all know I love my Mega 65, but you know, you can't carry it around with you when you go on trips. So one of the next best things you can do is run an emulator on your Mac, Linux, or Windows PC. So today with instructions in hand, by the way, all of these instructions will be on the companion blog post. What I'm gonna do is run you through the process of installing XEMU, the Mega 65 emulator on a Mac. After we get done with the installation, what I'll do is run you through some basics so that you can get started. Now, this is a pretty easy project, and until the Mega 65 is released, this is a great way for all of you out there interested in the Mega 65 to get some experience, get started in the developer community on the Discord channel, and just uh, play around with what could have been with a Commodore 65. This is gonna be a pretty casual and laid back video, not a lot of editing. This is pretty much gonna be in real time, and uh, you'll see some things that are probably should be edited at out, edited it out. Boy, that is hard to say, but uh, they are not. But anyway, let's go ahead and dive into this. So the first thing you need to do is go to the XEMU, XEMU, what do we want to call it? XEMU, we want to call it XEMU. Leave your comments below and let me know what you want to call this thing. I'm just going to say XEMU. And if you go to my website, stephencombs.com slash mega65, you will find links to all of the things I think are important for Mega 65 owners if you scroll past the blog post. Now this is an ever developing list. This will continue to, to grow as I become more familiar with the Mega 65 community and some great sites and developers out there. But if you look here, you'll see the XEMU link is right there. By the way, that link is also in the companion blog post. You're gonna find that as well as the step-by-step -step instructions. So let's go ahead and visit that page when we do. We'll come up with this nice color blue. I really dig this blue. It's a collection of emulators written by me, not by me, but by the developer here. And you'll see that we have lots of links on this page. Now, we do have the future next stable, still unstable branch builds here, but we don't want to do that. We want to scroll down and come down to the emulation enhancements merger branch builds right here. And what we're gonna do for a Mac, and I am assuming that the instructions, once we get past the install, are gonna be very similar on Windows and Linux. I cannot verify that, but I am going to go ahead and show you the OS X or Mac installation. And uh, it, again, so I think after we get the software installed, you should be able to go ahead and copy these steps mainly on Linux and Windows. Uh, right now, let's just try and download the software. It does let me know that this is for an x86 or Intel Max. I can verify that this also works on the M1 Max running under Rosetta, and it actually does a really good job. So we're gonna go ahead and say okay, but that is a nice warning to let you know that you are not getting a native M1 build. You'll notice that it, uh, it wants to, Safari in my case, wants to download the file. It won't take long, and you can find it right here in my downloads folder, right here. So what we're gonna do now is minimize this page. We're gonna run down here, and let's go ahead and drag this out so that you can see it and follow along. And then what we're gonna do is double click on the DMG file. We'll get this installer uh, general public license. Go ahead and agree to that if you agree. If you don't agree, then uh, you're done at this step. You can go home and uh, or stay home and grab a nice beverage. Now, as you see here, and I, can, I think I can blow these up a little bit for you, we do have some various install packages. So let's, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the neat things that's included with XEMU. Now, first of all, we do have a regular Commodore C65 emulator. This is not the Mega 65. This is based on what would have been and where the Commodore 65 was at a particular point in its development. We go across, we actually have the Commodore LCD computer. If you've not seen that, uh, Bill Hurd has a great video on his channel. We have a 128. Here's that X Mega 65 that we want. We have the Primo, we have the VIC uh, or the uh, VC, and then we have the VIC 20. So what we're going to do, you'll notice we have our little applications folder right here. And of course, we want to take this one right here and we're going to drag it to the applications. Now that application is, for all intents and purposes, installed on our Mac, right? We're used to that. Now I am not going to delete my DMG file, but I am going to go ahead and eject. With the application installed, we're now ready to run the application or the emulator. Now you could go ahead and browse to your applications folder. I'm a big Alfred user, so I'm just gonna type XE 
or X, there we go, X Mega 65. You can see it right here. You can also see it along with all of my Vice emulators installed on this Mac. Always good to have all the emulators on your Mac. So we're gonna go ahead and hit enter and this will start the application for the very first time. Now the first thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna have this option here that says cannot be opened because the developer cannot be verified. They've not gone through the verification process. It's okay, it's safe, it's all right. Feel free to do this. Now, be sure not to click this because if you move it to the trash, that's gonna just throw everything to trash. What we're gonna do is cancel and then using Alfred, I'm gonna call up my security and privacy pane. Once we do that, you'll see on the window here that this application, XMega65, was blocked from use because it is not an identified developer. So what I'm gonna do is open anyway. Once I do that, we'll get another dialog box that says, are you sure you want to open that unverified application? Again, it's fine, it's fine, just click open. Uh, but you can't blame me if something goes wrong. All right, now we are in the application here. I'm gonna go ahead and close this. And you'll see right now, it's, it's gonna throw a bunch of warnings at the beginning. It's okay. Uh, all of these warnings are in the companion blog post as well as what you're supposed to do next. And basically it's just a series of clicks, clicking the blue okay button. So let's say okay. It says cannot open the file, that's okay. Now, if you didn't know just to go ahead and click, you'd probably be thinking, oh, there's no way this is working. But believe it or not, it is working. Here's another one right here, cannot open the SD card. That's because we haven't created one yet. So of course we're going to get that error. We will do that here in a little bit. Click okay. And then it says, hey, default SD card image does not exist. Would you like for me to create one? You betcha, that's what we wanna do next. So be careful on this one, don't click no. Make sure you click yes, that's extremely important. So we're gonna click yes. And it says your created SD card image file has been auto F disk formatted by XEMU. Great, a little smiley face. I love the developer, he's got a great sense of humor. Uh, and uh, you see kind of little sparks of happiness all thrown out throughout his web page and the software. So we'll click okay. Now, again, another error, cannot find. And again, if you're brand new and weren't watching this video or read the blog post, you'd be really like, what's going on here? Is this thing ever gonna install? It, again, is okay, just press okay. Now, once we have that, we're going to get our Mega 65 emulator up and running, and you'll notice that it's in a continuous loop. That is a very good thing. Now, we have the software installed. Let me go ahead and blow up the screen here so we can make maximize our use of the screen. We need to configure XEMU, or from this point on, XMega65, because XEMU is the basic package, XMega65 is the emulator we're running. To configure XMega65, what we need to do is right click in the application, we need to go to SD card file, and we need to say update files on SD image. Then what's gonna happen is we're going to get this dialog box that says select your ROM image. Now, here's the problem. The XMega65 emulation software does not come with a ROM image. You have to provide your own ROM. Now there are two ROMs available. One is an official ROM that you have access to when you either purchase a Mega 65 or the developer kit or an open ROM is being developed and both will work. For my use case and for my demonstration today, I'm going to use the official ROM so it will look like a Mega 65 dev kit when it fires up. So let's go ahead and cancel this since we have not downloaded that. Now to download it, and you can see right here, it says you haven't updated, it says okay. So what I'm gonna do now is go back to my webpage so we'll back up here, and if you scroll here, you'll or if you look here, you're gonna find the Mega65 file host. Now this is the wonderful page that contains everything Mega65. This will include software, bit or core files for your systems for system upgrades, and it also has ROM files. There's also just a great selection of files internally of games that people are developing. It's a great way to check out and see what's coming for the Mega65. So we're gonna be looking for the ROM, and uh, we want the official ROM. So here are the open ROMs for the Mega65, if you wanted to download that and don't have access to the official ROMs. I have access to the official ROMs because I am logged into the file host with my developer account. And that gives me this one right here, the C65 Mega Kernel ROM. So I'm gonna click on that, and you'll see it gives me these great pictures of what the ROM should look like. Let's go ahead and just show you that right here. Here's the ROM in action. So once we add that to our XMega65 emulator, we should get 
those screens. So you'll see here it's a category firmware, it's a ROM file, blah, 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 all the way down the line. It was published on 30 August. Wow, this is this is actually more uh, up to date than the one I have on my Mega 65. So I can use the same ROM for the emulator and my Mega 65. So I'll be updating that a little bit later as well. So once we do that, we'll go ahead and minimize this. We will come back and you will see right here, we get this really weird name for it. I'm going to go and blow this up for you. And uh, I'll tell you what, let's just go ahead and drag this out to the desktop. Let's just try and keep everything on the desktop for you. If I can drag out to the desktop, here we go. And what we need to do is we need to rename this. Uh, if I try and load the ROM within the emulator, it won't recognize that. This needs a specific name. So we're going to call this, all caps, mega65.rom. Now when I do that, uh, I still it still shows it's a bin file, but that's okay. So let's go ahead and go back over here. We'll right click, we'll go SD card, update files on SD image. We're going to go to our desktop, and you'll see the Mega 65 ROM right there. We're going to open, and it says system files on your SD card image seem to be updated successfully. Next time you may need this function, you can use the Mega ROM, which is a, a backup copy. So it has created a backup. Um, but there wasn't one to begin with, so I don't believe there's any backup. So let's go ahead and say OK, and it says we're about to reset, and there you go. So we have loaded the most recent ROM in the XMega65 emulator, and we are cooking with gas. Let's see if we can do something. And uh, <laughs> so yeah, this is where it gets weird, because now you're using a PC keyboard to try and create software when you might be more familiar with the original keyboard on the Commodore. So that looks pretty good right there. 20, go to 10. Let's list that. And you can see the Mega 65 includes color highlighting for commands, which is really cool. Let's run that. And there you go. And so it appears that we have properly configured the X Mega 65 running the latest ROM. Congratulations to us. Let's see what's next. Let's go ahead and take some time to learn about the features of the XMega65 emulator. You know what? I changed my mind. Let's go ahead and install the open ROM as well. I would like for you to see the differences between the official ROM and the open ROM. So I'm going to come down here and go to open ROMs for the Mega65. See, we get this single picture here. We're going to download that. That gets downloaded. Now, I am going to need to rename this because I can't keep both of them the same name, or I could just keep it in this location. Let's just keep it in this location right now. Now, it does come as a zip file, so we're going to double click, double click to uh, decompress those, or unarchive those. And then inside here, you'll see this Mega 65 ROM. I'm going to just drag that out to my... And I'm having problems with my trackpad today, dragging and dropping. I'm going to go ahead and leave that in the downloads folder. We're going to come over here. We're going to right click. We're going to go back to our SD card and we're going to update files on the image. And we're going to go to our downloads folder, which should be here. And there's the ROM. Now you'll notice this one's in lowercase. And I'm going to keep this one in lowercase to remind me that that's the open ROM. And then the uppercase is the licensed ROM or official ROM. So let's go ahead and click open. Now it's going to say it's been updated. Let's reset it. Click OK. And it says ROM version cannot be detected. Warning, this may cause incorrect behavior. We do that. However, if you notice, everything loads fine. So let's go ahead and see if it's working. 10 print and uh, retro combs. And doop, doop. there we go. And 20 go to 10. Let's list. Let's see if we have the same code highlighting that we have in the official ROM. We do not. So you can see there will be some changes in the official ROM and the open ROM because those are being developed in different uh, cycles. The other thing I really I find it interesting, if you look in the open ROM, we get some additional information that we don't get in the official ROM. So we know which board, which video we're using, tape, IEC devices. So the open community is actually adding some features too that uh, really kind of uh, highlight the features and hardware of the Mega 65. So that's pretty cool. But let's go ahead and run this and make sure it runs. Nope, oh, syntax error in 10. Now, what is that about? So as I list, and if you look right now, I am locked up. Very interesting. So it seems like the open ROM uh, needs a little work or I have done something 
incorrectly. If you are a developer of the open ROM and you see what I've done incorrectly, please drop a comment below and I'll get the companion blog post updated. Before we run software, let's take a look at those menus, those options that are available within the application. So there is a whole litany of menus here. Now, these only appear here. They do not show up in the normal place where you typically find uh, menus for Mac OS X. They show up with a right click. First of all, we have a display. We have render scale quality. We can do nearest pixel, linear filtering, anistropic, direct 3D only. So that's Windows technology. We won't be using that. Window size, we can go full screen. We can go window 100%, 200%. Here's what full screen looks like. You can see that it started to stretch it on the edges, but you can see we get a nice full screen. Now, can we access our menus? We can. So let's just stay in this mode. That actually looks really good. We also have for display, you can say 100% or 200%. Here's our video standard. So depending on whether you're running PAL or NTSC software, you can switch that. I'm on NTC, NTSC. Let's see what happens there. You can see we get a little bigger screen and uh, takes more advantage of the space. I'm going to go ahead and leave that. Now, that's important, though, to remember that if you have software specifically for PAL or NTSC, you need to select the correct standard. We can also show full borders. If we click that, uh, you start to see a little more stretching out. We'll go ahead and keep that in there. And that is uh, actually at increasing an area here between the border and the page. Uh, let's go ahead and show an LED drive. I've not been able to get this to work. I'm not sure if this feature is available. We'll come back to it when we load software, if I remember it, and we'll see uh, if we can find that LED, but I've not been able to find that yet. The other thing that we have is a screenshot. Very, very handy. If you need a screenshot, we just click that. Screenshot, now where'd it go? Well, this is where it gets a little tricky. You would think that it might just go on your desktop or in your downloads folder. It does not. You have to right click. You have to come down to browse system folder. When you do that, you will get, I'll need to slide over here for you. Let me slide that over and you will get, and I'll blow this up, your system folder. And you can see a folder in here called screenshots right here. And we'll come back to this here in just a minute, but that's the screenshot that we just took of this. So it's right there, okay? So let's go back into here. We'll look some more at our, see, we have screen to OS pace buffer so that we can capture to and from our clipboard. Our input devices, we can enable a mouse grab, uh, use OCD key bugger, swap emulated joysticks. I've not had an opportunity to plug in joysticks yet to my emulator software. I do plan to do that at some point. Here's our audio output on, our OPL3 emulation, clear audio registers, simulated SIDs, or I'm sorry, emulated SIDs. We have some different types of SID, uh, or we have the SID emulated at different memory locations, I should say. We have our stereo separation, hard stereo, stereo separation, 50%, ways to control your sound. Our master volume, where do you want that to be? You can modify that. Our SD card, we've already talked about this. Update files on SD card, be very careful with this. When you reformat the SD card, it will overwrite all the work that you did here. So you have to be careful with that. Our floppy disk D81 attach. Now there's easier ways to do this. You can do this by just simply clicking. You get a menu, you go to the D81 and you attach it. But as uh, we'll show in a little bit, you can drag and drop right into the window, which is pretty slick. Here's our reset, reset M65, reset M65 without auto boot, reset into utility menu, which gives you an experience not dissimilar from a real mega 65 and reset into C64 mode. So for reset, we have reset the M665, the Mega 65, reset the Mega 65 without auto boot. So if you have something that would normally boot upon startup, uh, that will disable that. We can insert into the utility menu, which is specific to the Mega 65 and provide some options. It's like the BIOS, for instance, on a PC. We can also reset into C64 mode. Oh, this is pretty cool. Let's go ahead and do that. So you can see what C64 mode looks like. And now we're in C64 mode. Let me go ahead and change my display back to NTSC so you can see a little bit larger. There we go. We'll come back down and let's go ahead and reset to M65 mode. Say yes. Now you'll notice that all the settings when I reset go back to normal. There are ways to set that uh, using your configuration files or your utility so that it is constantly on, for instance, this mode right here. And I'm not constantly changing that. Okay, 
Uh, we also have d a debugger that's available. I am not a developer. I'm sure there are those of you that could help with that, but you can see that with some of the things we can do is we can start our monitor on 4510. We can dump the main memory into a file. Now, I, 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 can, I can get that one. Um, dump hyper RAM into a file for, I'm assuming, some test. And emulation state info. I'm really interested in that. What are our emulation state? DMA. Oh, we get some good information here about what and how the emulator is working. That's pretty cool. So we'll go ahead and get out of that. We'll come down here to run PRG directly. If I click on that, you can select a .prj file, not PRG, I think it said PRG, .prj file, and directly throw it in here and it will operate. It doesn't need to be on a disk image, which is a neat option. You also have help online. We can go right to the help page. If we click on that, we'll say yes, Click on that and that will load up the help page. And here's some information. Now, one of the reasons I've done this video is I've not found the help pages to be particularly useful as, I've, as, as I was trying to install. So I'm trying to provide, just provide some uh, additional video content that will make it easier for those of you who want to get into the X Mega uh, emulator a little bit easier and start your Mega 65 journey. So come back into here. Other help, check update, useful Mega 65 links. Click here, let's go ahead and say yes. Here's another page here, which comes off that pretty blue page that he has, but you can see some additional information here. Here's a project book, the official book, Mega 65 forum, and the GitHub repositories. Everything right there that you might need. Coming back over here to help, we have our download page, which um, hopefully you found that to download before. If not, remember you can go to my website, stephencombs.com slash mega65 and find the links that you need. And then finally, we have download the Mega 65 book. This is the user's manual. If you're not sure where to start, this is what you want. Let's give this a second to load. Now, this is the user's manual. So, in theory, with the emulator all installed and the user's manual, you can go ahead and start your Mega 65 journey before you have the actual physical hardware, which hopefully we'll get some information on when that might be released soon and when you can get your copy. So going back to our emulator and uh, we'll do a quick about, and then you can see all the information about the XEMU X Mega 65 emulator. Now, the last thing we have on here is browse system file. Now I showed you that when I wanted to share with you where screenshots were captured. Let's go ahead and hit this again. And uh, here are the system files. Now, some of these will make sense to you, uh, especially those of you that use the Mega 65. This, this is all very familiar to you, right? So we have some ROM files, we have some default files here. And if you look in there, there's nothing there now. There can be some default files in there. We won't cover that in this video. There is a key map default and key, or I'm sorry, Mega 65 template config. We'll talk about that in a minute. This Mega65.img file, does have some information in there that's useful. We'll come back to that in just a second. And here's our ROM and then again, our screenshots. I do wanna mount this Mega 65 image. Now, once it is mounted, what you're gonna find, if we double click, you're gonna find some additional files in here. These are the files that are necessary for the Mega 65 to operate and for the emulator to operate. Do not mess with these right now. Don't mess with those, you don't need to. You don't need to add D81 files or anything. Leave this alone. You just really don't need to do that. Let me show you why. If I come over here and I type DIR, you'll see that we have an empty disk image, right? That empty disk image is the file inside of here, and it is this mega65.d81. All right, so you already have a mounted disk image that you can start to work with. So for instance, if I do 10, and I wanna save that, hit enter, saving, pull up my directory, you can see that we already have a .d81 disk image that we can play with, so good to go. Now, the other thing I do wanna talk about is Depending on your keyboard, you may not have all the keys you need to stop software. So for instance, if I run this software right here that I've run, you'll notice it just continues to scroll. Wow, that's fast. XEMU uses, or the X Mega 65 uses the N key. Now, not every new keyboard, especially these smaller keyboards, have an N key. You typically need an N key 
uh, or typically end keys are found on keyboards with 100 characters or more, or 100 keycaps or more. Now, for my particular keyboard, I do have an end, but on the Mac, you can also hit, I believe it is control right arrow, and that will also give you an end. Uh, I will have all of these keystrokes in the companion blog post. So if you don't have an end key or you don't have another key that I'm demonstrating, go to the companion blog post and it'll tell you how to get those keys on a uh, Mac that isn't a full-size keyboard. Now, I did have this issue on my MacBook Pro. I had to figure this out because my MacBook Pro does not have an end key. So that's kind of interesting. Now, we also have function keys. And our function keys are all listed also in the companion blog post, what they do. And let me go ahead and pull up my list here and show you what function keys do. So first of all, F1 select, and I've got to make sure if I hit F1 right now, I'm in Mac mode. So I have to hold my function key, I'm sorry, and hit F1 and watch what happens to my screen. So now I've gone from 80 character mode to 40 column mode. So going from 40 column to 80 column mode. So let's go ahead and do this. Let's run the same program in 40 column mode. And you can see that there. So I'll hit end to end that. F2, if we hit that one, that one is not assigned, nothing there. But you can uh, actually assign keys to do certain things. Now that's a little bit beyond what I'm gonna cover today, but a little something for you to go out and research. F3 is common if you use a plus four or a 128, that is your directory. So instead of having to type DIR, you can find your function key and press F3 and holy cow, there's not much saved there, is there? By the time you find it, but it is an option. F4 is interesting. F4, if you hit function F4, you get a listing from the disk of only PRJ files. Now this is really handy if you have a disk that contains a bunch of SEQ files or some other data files. You can just hit, you could type this command obviously, but if you function F4, you wildcard out and only get the PRJ file. So that's pretty handy. If we come up here and now I function F5, you'll see that it moves over one word. So we're moving a word at a time through the document. And so that's moving left one word at a time. So if you need to quickly move through words, that's an easy way to do it. So that is function F5. Function F6, this is interesting. I, I actually asked this on the uh, developer forum. Uh, well, what, what does this do? And so here's F6, it just prints F6 key. Thanks for that information. Thanks for telling me that when I press the F6 key, I'm pressing the F6 key, that's very handy. Uh, of course, that's the beginning of a way that we can assign what that key does, a little, little tip for you. Now, we did uh, before with function F5, remember that was moving words, oops, there we go, get the right one, that was moving back a word. If you use F7, that moves us forward a word. So it's interesting that key six is right in the middle there, but you gotta remember five and seven to move through the words. Now again, these keystrokes also work on the physical mega. Now F8 is for all of you assembly language aficionados. That's gonna take us right into our monitor and you can start to work within the monitor and develop your, your, your machine code programs. So we're in the monitor. If you want to exit the monitor, you just press X, you hit enter, and now you're back to your basic. F11 is full screen mode. We're already there, so we won't talk about that one. And then F12 does absolutely nothing. So there you go, there are your function keys. Now that we've configured, we kind of know how to use it. I know it's a little long-winded, but let's learn how to run software on the emulator. Now, the first thing I need to do is I need to get out of full screen mode. So I'm just gonna right click here. I'm gonna go to my display and I am going to choose window 100%. Now, when I do that, that's gonna take the screen and make it pretty small. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and scale that a little bit. 200% probably would have been best. I mentioned earlier that you could mount disk images by coming over here, going uh, FD, attach, and then you can do all the selection business, but you don't need to do that. So let's go ahead and drag a, this application right here. This is, a, this is called 11. It is a development package for the Mega 65. And what I'm gonna do is just drop this here, and it's gonna say, what do you wanna do? Do you wanna mount that as a D81 or do you run and inject that as a PRJ? I want to mount that one as a .D81 because that's what I've selected. Now, if I hit F3 on my keyboard, you'll remember we get our directory listing. Now, the nice thing about this is we can come up here 
And we can auto boot that by just simply doing a slash. I'm gonna kill these. And normally we would have to go all the way over here and get rid of this, but check this out. This is really kind of a, a neat feature of the Mega 65. All right, so that's loaded. You'll notice it loaded. We didn't have to get rid of that extension. We run, and now we are in 11, which is a development environment and one that I've just really been wanting to try uh, to dive into. It looks so cool, but if you look, we're scrolling on the screen, but we're not scrolling by, we're, ac we're also scrolling up. So if I load an application, and I wasn't really intended to spend a lot of time in here, but I just have so much fun playing in here, ffire.el, and it loads that, and you can see here, and then what we can do is we can compile that and run it. So let's do function f5, and now it's going through, and depending on the speed of your computer, now we have a simulator, which is a force fire. So let's just use the default probability, and there you go. And so you start to see uh, the simulator of the forest fire. Now to get out of that, I hit escape. I hit F1 to go back. And now we're back in. So you can see it's a really interactive way to develop software without having to reset and restore the Mega 65. It's pretty cool. Now that is one piece of software. Let me go ahead and reset. We're going to hit reset Mega 65. I'm going to say yes. So that was a D81 file. What I would also like to do is show you that I can uh, inject a .prj file as well. So if I drag this .prj file, I can run and inject as a PRJ, and it automatically loads that program file. And I think I've been saying PRJ. It's a PRG. I'll get that right eventually. Oh, look at that. I plugged in my joystick from DC64 and I'm cooking with gas in my mega emulator playing this Pac-Man clone. Look at this. It's a little bit different in that the uh, ghost can actually go all over the place and I can only go along the path. So that is pretty interesting. So I think I'm just going to play for a few minutes. And uh, again, I just plugged in the DC64 joystick that I had laying around and it worked perfectly. That's pretty nice. That's, uh, that's, that's good stuff. So the other thing that we can do, so I'm going to reset our Mega 65 here and say yes. I mentioned that, you know, there is a, um, there's a uh, C64 mode built in. So what I'm going to do now is, I've been showing this game, it's called Bad Moon Rising. It is a newer game uh, from uh, a developer for the C64. So I'm going to plug this in and I'm going to say mount as a D81. So now if I type DIR, you'll see that's in there, but now I'm going to go 64. So this is how we can get to C64 mode. I'm going to say yes. And then I'm going to do load. And this is a PAL game. So I think I am in PAL, but by the way, my screen looks, I'm going to do the standard. Oh, we got to find my asterisk. That's right. There we go. On this uh, Mac keyboard, it's a little bit different. Comma eight, comma one. And now if everything works, we should have a Commodore 64 game running in our X Mega 65 emulator. I love the opening for this game if you've not seen it. Oh, joystick is working, perfect. And then I can move up and down. There you go, we have easy, normal, hard. And I've been playing this in uh, other videos I've done, so you can get a chance to see portions of it. I will not spend any more time here. The last thing I wanna show you is located in the system folder. And I showed it to you a little bit earlier, but I really didn't talk about it. It's this key map default and Mega 65 template config. So I'm gonna double click on that and I'm gonna open both of those with Adam. Okay, so now I have both of these. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this so that you can see. And let's go ahead and blow this up a little bit so that you can see these lines. So this is the Mega 65 template and this is the key map default. Now, first of all, I mentioned earlier that there were some settings. There are some settings in here that are user accessible. You can go through here, you can read the comment lines here. You can see what the options are and you can start to modify your emulation environment for either gameplay, application, or more importantly, probably developer mode. And you see we have all kinds of default settings. So if I turned on allow mouse grab equals false, I could do this, do this, come over here, do true. Now when I start the application, every time I start it, it's gonna grab my mouse. Not probably a good idea unless you've configured this for say, Geos, right? Uh, Geos would be a good use of that. Uh, you come down here, we have some other options. Load and start the first program from disk. You can have that auto load. So every time you boot it up, if you were working in um, 
the 11 development software on a regular basis constantly. Maybe you want to put that on as true, load that .d81 file and it just loads automatically upon startup. Here is that render LED drive at the top right corner of the screen. Looks like the drive LED is turned to false. You know, I'm kind of curious, can we fix that? I've not tried this, I am doing this live. We're gonna make that true. Uh, I'm going to say save and see what happens. I'm going to come back and see if that worked. And then you have some other things. So uh, remind me out there to come back to that. But you see you have a lot of different options to include starting with uh, C64 mode. So that is the Mega 65 template if you want to mess around with that. Just be careful. I highly recommend you make a backup of this in case you mess it up. The other one kind of allows you to get over that limitation I said with Mac keyboards that sometimes don't have all of the keys. This is your key map default. You can come in here and change your default key map. You can change it to be uh, where the uh, characters that are normally on the keyboard the Mac keyboard in their normal location are back to normal. You can keep it in the Commodore layout format if you want. You can uh, hit that run, stop, restore. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we don't have an end key on my MacBook Pro. I could change it to something else, but you just need to be careful because if you change it here and it's somewhere else, you're going to get a conflict in those selections. But that is available. I am considering rewriting this for my MacBook Pro. If I do, I will put a blog post up there and share my new key map and probably put that up on GitHub too. But I'm not sure yet if I'm going to do that, just a, a little teaser out there. So let's go ahead and let's close this one. I did save this for that LED. I wanna see if that LED is rendered now. So I'm saving that, although I have it where auto, Adam automatically saves. Let's go ahead and come back out of here. And I'm gonna to need to restart the software. So let's go ahead and reset. You know what, I, I well, let's just make sure. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of this completely. Uh, I think it has to restart the entire development software or the entire emulation software and not just reset in order for that configuration file. So I'll do like X mega, we'll load that up. Here it is and uh, let's go ahead and I think we can do this easier. If we just go to display, say 200%, there we go, that works pretty well. And let's see if we can get drive access. So I said light on, now let's see if I need to do the display show drive LED. What I don't like is it doesn't have a little check there to let me know if it's turned on or off. So let's go ahead and something that will require it. Let's come back in here and do this one. Let's mount that. Mount is a D81. And let's pull up our directory. Let's go up here and do our quick load command. I just really love that. Now let's look somewhere on the screen for an LED light. Oh, there it was. Did you see it? It was up here in this right-hand corner. That's pretty cool. So we'll just come down here, and uh, I'm not sure. It should access a little bit more. Let's see what happens. Yeah, there it is. You can see it up there for just a second. I think if we come over and reload our Bad Moon Rising, that's going to force it into 64 mode, and uh, that is going to uh, really give us some drive activity. So let me go ahead and reset 65. Yes. I'll need to redrag this. Put that back in there, mount is D81, go 64, yes, I am positive, and load, oops, load, do, 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 eight comma one. Let's see if that light shows up. There it is, it's up there, see it? It's right up here in this right-hand corner. So as it's loading, we do have, now it looks like when it changed into graphics mode, we lost it. So it's, oh, oh no, wait, there it was, see it? There it is. So we've, I just learned something in this video. Here's, that's how you can turn on your LED mode is by changing that configuration file. So there's a little, little tip, a little extra perk for you. Let's go ahead and reset this. So we're back to our Omega 65 development system emulator. We're ready to start typing, coding, programming, playing games, everything we need to do. All right, so that was a blast. I really enjoyed that. And again, this is not a, a really fleshed out edited piece. It's kind of a live stream of conscious kind of video, but here's the, here's the C64 joystick that I was using. Uh, again, it is simply a USB device that comes with the DC64, uh, which is really nice when you're running emulators. This has worked on Vice for me as well. Uh, highly recommend uh, this as well as a couple of other joysticks that I'm going to put down in the uh, video description below. But you can you don't have to buy a DC64 to get this joystick. You can purchase this individually. So again, I'll have the link down there for you if you want to do that. And probably should throw one of these in a bag or a gamepad in a bag with my 
uh, MacBook because now I can take games with me on the go as well as my Mega 65 development environment. All right, that concludes this video and companion blog post. Don't forget about the companion blog post where it has all of these instructions that you need to do exactly what I just showed you, which is install XEMU, the XMega65 emulator on your Mac. And again, I assume that on Linux and Windows, it won't be much different once you get it installed. So I hope you enjoyed this little foray down emulation station row and um, stay tuned. There's a lot more Mega65 content coming, especially as we get closer and closer to the release of the Mega65. I'll be publishing all kinds of stuff. Be sure and come over to the Discord channel and visit us in the Mega65 developer community. Again, a link will be down in the video description at the companion blog post. But for now, that's a lot of content for day. So you know how I always end these things. Retro Combs out.